Online Personality Disorder Patient and Family Education Initiative webinar series. My name is Dawn Sugarman. I'm a clinical psychologist at McLean Hospital and instructor of psychology at Harvard Medical School. We are very pleased to have back with us again tonight Dr. Christopher Palmer. Dr. Palmer is a practicing psychiatrist and the director of postgraduate and continuing education at McLean Hospital. And he is also assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Palmer um, was a speaker at our last webinar on September 14th, as many of you had um, joined that webinar have had the chance to also listen to it on recording. We, um, Dr. Palmer gave a wonderful presentation and we had several questions that we were unfortunately able, not able to get through. So Dr. Palmer agreed to come back today and devote a full hour to questions and answers from participants. If you registered uh, before Monday, you received an email inviting you to have the opportunity to submit questions in advance, and several of you did. And we are going to try to get through as many questions as we can tonight. Um, we also encourage you to type in questions during the webinar. Um, your microphones have all been muted, so please use the question and answer box, which you'll see at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, um, to type in your questions. We ask that you, you know, do that at any time. The earlier, the better, so we can get your questions in queue. Um, if you haven't had a chance to watch the, the recording of, the, of Dr. Palmer's webinar or if you want to see some of our previous webinars, in the middle of your screen you'll see our, our website listed there. We archive all of the webinars and post them on our website. If you'll notice on the bottom of your screen there's also some additional web links. The first one is to our website. Um, the next three, the, the BPD Resource Center, NEA BPD, and the Behavioral Tech clinician directory, those are uh, web links that might be helpful for you to find treatment resources in your area. We also have a link for registering for our October webinar, which will be on the 13th with Dr. Jillian Galen, and she's going to talk about validation. Um, and I, lastly, I want to mention that the initiative is funded uh, by a generous donation from a family that's been affected by BPD, and if you wish to also um, make a gift to support the series, you'll see under the web link there's a link to do that as well. So in the interest of time, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Palmer so we can get to your questions. So uh, thank you, Don, and uh, it is uh, really a pleasure to be back. Um, if you did watch the last webinar, either participated in it um, with us live or watched it on the archive version, you know that I talked too much and uh, went through a tremendous amount of information um, and didn't really leave a lot of time for questions. So uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to come back and I'm glad that a lot of you were interested enough um, to want to come back and have questions about the material that I presented. Um, and also just questions about borderline personality disorder and its treatment. I'm really happy to make this an open forum and an open discussion. We've already had several questions kind of pre-submitted, so we'll be going through some of them. But in tonight's webinar, we're going to experiment a little bit with um, some of the interactive tools on Adobe Connect. And so the first thing that I want to do is I'm going to take a poll from all of you. And um, I just want to get a sense of who all of you are. So why are you attending this webinar tonight? If you can click uh, one of those boxes, that will give us a good sense of who you are and why you're here. So it seems like we've really got a variety of people. Seems like the majority of you have a child with BPD. And the second most likely reason you're here is because you have borderline personality disorder yourself. But then we've got some mental health professionals and others who are interested. So that's actually really helpful to me to make sure that I'm framing my answers in a way that hopefully is helpful for you. Um, and so if we can go to the first slide.
a very brief overview of the presentation that I gave um, is that I, I ended up summarizing with this particular slide. Um, and it shows most of the interventions that I referred to um, regarding borderline personality disorder. So the mainstay treatment that most people think of is psychotherapy. Um, medications are often used in the treatment of BPD, um, but there is no FDA-approved medication for it. Um, but then I listed all of these other things. Hospitalization, a lot of people think of hospitalization as going along with it. But then I talked about mindset. I talked about exercise, mindfulness, meditation, diet, um, having structure in your life, how co-occurring disorders can affect the treatment and recovery from borderline personality disorder, sleep, relationships, and then going to school, getting a volunteer job, um, or getting employment, uh, full-time paid employment. And so I want to take another quick poll. And of those of you who have come to tonight's webinar with a specific question in mind, I'm wondering, is there a particular topic that you are most interested in? So if you can choose one or two, please don't check them all because that won't be very helpful. So if you can just choose one or two the areas, if we end up seeing that like the majority of you are interested in one particular topic, we're, we're probably going to prioritize questions related to that topic so that we can make this the most useful for you. <coughs> So keep the answers coming in. Right now, it looks unequivocally clear that relationships are a big um, relationships are a big issue, and psychotherapy is a second. Um, and then the other ones, mindset, co-occurring disorders, third and fourth, and and then the other areas, not so much. So that's actually very extremely helpful. Um, so I will do my best to try to frame some of the answers, even if the question isn't directly related to relationships. I'll try to tie that in when it's appropriate and when it makes sense. So why don't I'm going to turn the questions over to Dawn Sugarman, whom you just saw, and she is going to be moderating and reading me questions that are uh, submitted. Okay. So our first question says, I am a 22-year-old in recovery from BPD. DBT has helped me significantly in reducing many of my old behaviors, but there is one thing that I continue to struggle with immensely and which I cannot find a solution to. I have attachment issues, which cause me a great amount of stress. I'm attached to certain people in my life, for example, therapist, certain friends, partner, and when there is any interpersonal issues between us, it sends me into a complete delusional crisis to the point of feeling suicidal, even if moments before I was fine. I was wondering what suggestions are out there for the issues with attachment people with BPD face. I have many friends with BPD who are in the same position. I'm considering EMDR to try and tackle my early developmental trauma in the hopes that this could help. So what would you suggest? So um, this is actually an extremely important and phenomenal question. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that this question was submitted by somebody who is in recovery from borderline personality disorder. And I want to make an observation based on my last talk and, uh, and give you kind of recognition for being somebody with a growth mindset um, for learning as much as you can about the, treat the treatments that are available to you, for attending this webinar, all in an effort to get better. And I think that it really takes a brave and strong person to kind of acknowledge where your weaknesses still are or what areas are kind of problematic or getting you into trouble and looking for solutions. So the first and foremost thing I want to say is great for you, and if you keep up that kind of mindset uh, and you keep up your proactive stance, I really do believe you're going to get better. Um, so that's first and foremost. Um, 
In terms of your specific question about uh, EMDR uh, for the treatment of attachment issues, um, EMDR, for those of you who don't know, stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. So it is a treatment that has been developed for post-traumatic stress disorder. In the studies that have been done, it is a very, very brief treatment. The, the major studies that have been published in, uh, involved only three to six sessions one hour session, so that's three to six hours of treatment total um, in order to prove whether it was effective or not. And all of those studies, the only thing they really assessed were the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. They did not study this interpersonal hypersensitivity or attachment issues as you're alluding to. And so what we know about EMDR is that um, it has been shown in several studies to be effective for the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And those symptoms usually are kind of re-experiencing traumatic thoughts, having flashbacks, having nightmares, being hypervigilant. It's those types of symptoms. And those are the symptoms that EMDR seems to make better. There's a little bit of controversy in our field about is EMDR a real treatment? Does it really work as well as some of those studies say it does? And um, I, I think that in general the field leans toward it probably works at least for some people because the American Psychiatric Association, American Psychological Association, the Veterans um, Department all list EMDR as a possible treatment for PTSD. However, I want to I wanna recognize that they actually list cognitive behavioral therapy and prolonged exposure as definitively much, much more effective than EMDR for PTSD. So by no means is EMDR ever kind of the primary treatment or the primary recommendation for PTSD. Most organizations don't recognize it as that. But if it helps you, then great. Um, and so, uh, so the bottom line is I would not recommend EMDR for the treatment of the attachment issues that you're referring to because they don't, it, that, those aren't classic PTSD symptoms. So instead, I'm going to give you a couple of answers. So one answer is the kind of the, what most experts in our field would tell you. And that is, you are absolutely right, you have attachment issues that a lot of clinicians and researchers believe that attachment issues are in fact the cause of borderline personality disorder. And so if you do have borderline personality disorder, you must have had attachment issues in childhood. And there are two treatments that have specifically been designed to address those attachment issues, and those are transference-focused psychotherapy, um, which is a psychodynamic type of therapy, or mentalization-based treatment, which is uh, designed, which is based on mentalizing, as I described in the webinar. Um, and both of those treatments and their proponents would say that's the right answer, that if you're having attachment problems, and these interpersonal difficulties in your relationships are probably a symptom of that, that you should engage in one of those two types of psychotherapy and call it a day, and those should help you. So that's the official answer that would come from a lot of experts. And now I'm going to give you my answer. And my answer, I'm hoping you watch the webinar, my answer is nobody knows what causes borderline personality disorder. First and foremost, I always remind myself of that not just for BPD, but for every psychiatric disorder. Nobody knows what causes it. So as soon as people start saying, well, the cause of my BPD is attachment problems, and so how am I going to address that? I almost always interrupt them and say, well, how do you know the cause of your BPD is attachment? Because nobody has proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt. 
And the big point I want to make is that nobody, no researcher, can prospectively look at 100 children and tell me or anyone else which of them is going to develop borderline personality disorder and which will not. Even if I gave them a sample of 100 children who have all been sexually abused, no one can tell me which ones will grow up to develop borderline personality disorder and which ones won't. They can't even tell me which ones will grow up to develop PTSD and which ones won't. So there's more to the cause of borderline personality disorder and PTSD than attachment or trauma. And I think it's a really critically important point. Um, so, so what do you do about it? It's interesting because I think almost all of the psychotherapy treatment for borderline personality disorder, including DBT, have sometimes at one point or another been studied, in particular in terms of their efficacy related to these interpersonal relationships. So when uh, you talk about being attached to certain people and then when there's any interpersonal issue, um, everything kind of blows up and you almost quickly become delusional and suicidal. Um, and. Uh, DBT is definitely a treatment that can address that. And there have been some head-to-head -head studies of DBT versus transference-focused psychotherapy and MBT showing that it's probably just as effective for those symptoms, those traits, as the other treatment. But I'm going to take you at your word. You've tried DBT. You've gotten some benefit from it, but you're still having these problems. So DBT or the therapist that you were working with didn't really help you address these ongoing problems. And so what to do? So again, the big point I want to make is we don't, I, I'm going to take a little bit of issue with calling them attachment issues because that implies a cause. So instead, if you really want to work on these problems, I would encourage you to be as concrete and specific as you can be about what your symptoms really are. So a common symptom in borderline personality disorder is called rejection sensitivity. So those are people who anytime they sense that somebody is disapproving of them or might be getting frustrated with them or angry with them, they kind of, they either get really anxious or they get frightened and terrified or they really just freak out. Um, and that can freak out, could be an anger outburst, it could be self-injury, it could be a suicide attempt, or at least feeling suicidal. And, uh, and if you can identify what the specific symptoms are, so like if rejection sensitivity sounds right to you, then in what situations does it get triggered? Um, and the more detailed you can be, the more that you can kind of methodically walk through the relationships that have been problematic and what happened and where did the problems occur. Once you can identify that, even if you can just make a list of like here are the top five problematic attachment issues as you described them over the last like year, if you can make a list you can start to see a theme and a pattern about what the symptom really is. And whether it comes from attachment issues in childhood or not is really irrelevant. Because what's most relevant is what's happening right now in your life, in your emotional world. Um, and so if you can be concrete about that, then you can kind of come up with a plan to address it. So some plans, again, most of the psychotherapeutic techniques have plans and different designs to address some of these issues. DBT has certain skill sets to address it. But I want to offer a couple more. Um, so one concept that's very outside of the borderline personality disorder realm, but that I think is very appropriate for BPD, is the concept of anxiety disorder. And so we know that um, when people have an anxiety disorder or panic attack, what happens is that all of a sudden they get triggered and they have intense fear. And for people with panic attacks, they, their heart starts racing, they feel like they might be dying, they're short of breath, all that stuff. 
And in a way, you can conceptualize this problem that you've identified in a similar way, that when you get cues from another person that they might be angry with you or they might disapprove of you or they might run away from you and leave you, you freak out. And we know from anxiety research that the best treatment for that actually is exposure therapy. Um, so kind of confronting those fears head on. And so one thing that you might consider doing is talking with a therapist or a friend or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whomever about, you know, we're really good right now and I feel secure and everything's fine, but will you help me kind of practice scenarios where it feels to me like you're getting angry with me? And then you learn skills to manage your reaction so that instead of freaking out, instead of becoming suicidal, you, you manage the reaction in another way. And that can be with concrete DBT skills. It can be with mindfulness and meditation. It can be with lots of other things. But that's a general framework. And then the last point that I want to make about this, that a lot of people would frame this issue that you're describing as low self-esteem. And there's no doubt that a lot of people with borderline personality disorder have low self-esteem. Um, as I talked about, a lot of them feel unlovable. And so even when they feel like things are okay, they're always worried that something's going to go wrong and the people are going to run away from them uh, and leave them. And, um, and so the, a common question that I get is, well, how do you treat self-esteem? How do you improve self-esteem? And improving self-esteem, quite honestly, ends up being a multi-pronged approach. And if I can go back to my master slide, I'm going to make the argument that if you really want to improve self-esteem, you have to address all of these things on this chart. So sitting with a psychotherapist and talking about your low self-esteem for weeks or months or years probably will not improve your self-esteem. That in and of itself won't do it. And as a psychotherapist for over 20 years, I've tried that. I've tried my best to do that with patients and it has never worked for me. Instead, what I've found is that in order to improve patient self-esteem, talking is important and talking is one of the things that we need to do and talking about those feelings and those thoughts are part of it but people have to develop a life. People have to have relationships. They have to have structure. Exercise can help it. Mindfulness and meditation can help it. Getting good sleep is really important. Feeling useful. Feeling like you have meaning and purpose in your life. And that could be school, volunteer job, employment. Um, all of those things play a role in self-esteem. And at the end of the day, if you have a lot of those things in place and your self-esteem is improved, you'll, you'll slowly but surely begin to feel more secure in your relationships. And hopefully you'll have a lot of other relationships to turn to so that you're not dependent on just one person, just one therapist or just one boyfriend. And if that person leaves you, your whole world is turned upside down and you're like decimated that instead you'll have friends, you'll have family, you'll have good relationships with lots of people. You might even be in school or at a job and you'll have acquaintances and friends there. So that if one relationship ends, yes, it will be heartbreaking. Yes, it will be hard. You'll probably feel at least mildly depressed. You might feel a little empty. But you may not resort to suicidality and your world probably won't be turned upside down. So. I'm hoping that's helpful. It was long-winded, but it was a complicated question for me to really answer. So I'm happy to kind of move on to the next question, if that makes sense. Okay, so question number two. I have a sibling who is resistant to acknowledging his illness, so suggesting treatment is even problematic. Are there suggestions or tactics on how to encourage him to seek help? So the, the biggest thing that I would say about this is that if somebody does not want to acknowledge that they have borderline personality disorder, I would not try to force it on them. 
So even as a psychotherapist and psychiatrist, when I have patients who, ha who I believe have borderline personality disorder, but they are very reluctant to hear the diagnosis or accept it, I don't, I, I don't get into arguments over it. It's irrelevant what the label is. And so instead, um, as a psychiatrist, I'll work with them on the problems that are concerning to them. And usually that might include some depression or anxiety, maybe sleep problems, interpersonal difficulties, problems managing stress, whatever they want to say. And I'll ask them, I mean, the, the basic framework that I, the basic question that you could ask um, a sibling would be, you know, I really care about you, and I'm just wondering, like, are you okay with where you're at in your life? Is this where you want to be? If they say yes, this is, that's where they want to be, I don't think you really have much hope in convincing them to get help because they haven't identified a problem. Um, hopefully, they'll have enough symptoms and problems in their life that they're going to say, no, this isn't where I want to be. Um, and if they say no, then you can ask them, well, what would you want to be different? Um, so they might be depressed and they might say, if I just felt better, then I could get on with my life. And, and then you have something to work with. And so instead of saying, well, you have borderline personality disorder, you need help for borderline personality disorder, so kind of mimic whatever they tell you. So if they say, I'm depressed and it's hard for me to get on with my life until I fight this depression or get rid of it, then you can say, that's really a shame. I wish I could help you with your depression. I've tried different things, but I don't know what to do. I'm not a mental health professional. I don't know how to treat this. But there are people out there who do know how to treat depression. Would you want to consider maybe getting help for it so that you can just live the life that you want to be living. Um, you know, when you, when you, so that would be the overall approach, hoping for a yes answer, that you get something from them that they, um, or a no answer, I'm sorry. So you get something from them that they want to change, that they consider problematic in their life. If, if they tell you, no, my life is great, this is the way I want it, there's no problem, and you really think they genuinely mean that, if you think they're just lying to you and because they don't want to fight, then I would work on building up the relationship with them so that they can feel more comfortable telling you the truth. But if you feel like they're really kind of in denial and uh, they really have serious problems and they actually don't think they need to change, then it takes almost the form of like working with somebody who's an alcoholic and doesn't really recognize how bad it is and how it's affecting everyone else. And then you can make statements to the person about how their behavior or emotions or whatever are impacting you or people they care about. So you can say, well, I'm glad that your life is really great, but you know, having you around all day sleeping in bed and not doing anything makes me sad, and sometimes it makes me pretty frustrated because I want my space or I, you know, I feel like I have to work so hard and here you get to do nothing or whatever. And, um, but so I think that the more that you can point out how the um, behaviors are problematic and being specific and concrete is so important, um, the more likely the person will seek help. Okay, we have a question that was submitted that I, I think would be interesting to discuss as people are thinking about um, the scenarios that other, other participants have um, mentioned and, and how to sort of frame the answers, is that someone had mentioned, um, you know, is BPD potentially too widespread a diagnosis spectrum in its own right based on the idea that a diagnosis of BPD requires five of the nine DSM identified symptoms that gives a staggering 200 plus possible combinations of symptoms that fall under BPD, yet each combination can result in a variety of overall scenarios. What are your thoughts on that? 
So you and I are right in line. Um, I made the almost the same observation uh, in the talk that I did in the webinar, so I'm hoping you watched that and heard that first slide that I went over. Um, all psychiatric disorders, not just borderline personality disorder, every, each and every one of the psychiatric disorders is a syndrome. It means that we don't know what causes it, and we do not have an objective biological or other test to give people that will give us a definitive yes or no answer. And I completely agree with you. There are a lot of different combinations of symptoms that can result in some people looking very shy and passive and other people being very angry and belligerent. Um, some people can have scars all over their body from chronic self-injury, and other people have never done that once in their life. And do those people really have the exact same illness? Probably not. Um, it's interesting that, uh, well, before I, before I digress, I want to say, and yet, that's what we have in psychiatry. That is where we're at. And there's no question that people who do meet the criteria seem to have a lot in common. Um, and as a group, as a cohort, they seem to have a lot in common. But there is wide variability. So some people have borderline personality disorder for two years and then go into complete recovery and never have it again. And they never actually get treatment. They never get hospitalized. And so nobody really takes much notice other than the family members and, you know, other people that have relationships with them. But that does happen. And is that person's illness really the same as somebody who ends up having a chronic, lifelong, devastating illness? Probably not. Um, but again, unfortunately, it's the best that we've got. Um, the same thing can be said for the syndrome of major depression. Um, people with major depression can look very different and can also have different courses and outcomes. The benefit of the diagnosis is that it does kind of suggest some treatments that might be effective. And that's why I'm such a big fan of trying a lot of different things and never assuming you know what caused it. Because once you assume you know what caused it, then you're going to go after one or two special treatments based on that hypothesis. And if those don't work for you, you may not get better. And so I'm really, I really encourage people to have a very broad, open mind always and just try a lot of different things to see what works. So our third question, um, this is someone who had, who had um, viewed your previous webinar and um, you had discussed medication and the treatment of BPD. The message resonated as I had watched as my daughter was prescribed one medication after another and I felt the meds only exacerbated her symptoms. I lost track of what or how many meds she was on and there was no evidence from my viewpoint that the meds were working. Since she's an adult, I was not always informed. For a long time, she seemed to be looking for the quick fix with the meds, but recently she seems to have come to the conclusion that the meds were not working and took herself off all meds about a month or two ago. She also began an intensive treatment program for BPD, and I believe she is now ready to do the work and has a growth mindset about her treatment. Do you feel it is possible for BPD patients to manage their treatment without meds? And can you speak to the outcome remission recovery in that regard? So uh, this is a great question, and uh, I share your viewpoint. I've seen many, many patients who have been through uh, what your daughter has been through, prescribed one medication after another, and either they didn't help, and in my mind, sometimes I think they made things worse and even caused a lot of problems that probably would not have occurred otherwise. Um, so it's so nice that you submitted this question ahead of time um, because it gave me an opportunity to curbside Dr. Zanarini, who, as you might recall, um, uh, is the primary investigator on the uh, longest longitudinal study of borderline personality disorder in existence. It's occurring right here at McLean. It's been going on for over 22 years. And she has probably done the most extensive work 
characterizing who goes into remission, who goes into recovery, how do we distinguish all of those things. And I asked her, and she, interestingly, they have not studied this, so she does not have definitive data on how many people who go into remission or recovery are not on medication. Her gut sense was that most of them were still taking some medication. I can tell you anecdotally, as a clinician who's treated lots of people with borderline personality disorder, that I have several patients who got completely off all medicines, no longer in psychotherapy, and they are doing phenomenally well. Um, one person came to me after she was in her 20s and she had over 15 years of intensive treatment, multiple, multiple hospitalizations, suicide attempts, self-injury, and most of the clinicians who'd worked with her before had basically said she was going to be like that for the rest of her life. She might need to live in a group home um, or even a state hospital that they didn't know what could be done for her. And after several years of treatment, so I didn't do it overnight, I don't claim that, but after several years of working with her, um, we got her off of all the medicine and she is no longer in psychotherapy, hasn't been in quite a while, works full-time, finished college, works full-time, has a boyfriend, is doing well. Um, and she's one person that I believe that the medications were, were actually causing a lot of her symptoms. Because as we, as we went down one by one on different medications and got on lower and lower doses, her symptoms got better and she improved dramatically. But I want to point out the caveat that each and every time we lowered the medicine, she would temporarily, for a week or two, get a little worse. It was terrifying for her, for me a little, but I had been through it with a lot of other patients and so I kind of expected it. But when you lower the dose even a little bit, a lot of people will go into withdrawal and their symptoms will get a little bit worse. If they get a lot worse, then I just go right back on the medicine. And then I find a dose at which I can decrease it a little more. But the bottom line is I do, anecdotally in my own practice, have former patients now who completely recovered for all intents and purposes and got off of medication. Okay. Well, we have another uh, question that was typed in related to remission and really what that means. Um, this person says, my daughter's been struggling with her BPD for a decade. She's progressed to a point where we've been very hopeful that she could have a normal life numerous times only to unravel again. One sees statistics citing that a large percentage of patients with BPD have a remission of two years. For us, the next question is then, okay, then what? Is there really any hope that she'll be able at some point to lead a somewhat stable life where she can hold a job, make a decent living, be happy, and can this last more than two years? Before they going around in this carousel. So the, the quick answer, is there a guarantee? No. Um, can it happen? Absolutely. Um, so you, I think you said 10 years. And the 16-year the study, um, for the longitudinal um, study that Dr. Zanarini conducted, the 16-year study found that four out of five people um, had an eight-year or longer remission. And once people get to an eight-year or longer remission, there's only a 10% chance of recurrence of symptoms. Now again, does that mean that they have zero symptoms? Does that mean that, she, that this person will have no depression whatsoever? They will be happy and joyful and stress-free and they'll manage conflicts perfectly and if they're in a relationship and it breaks up, they'll be fine just like everyone else. No, it does not mean that. Um, that some of those symptoms will probably linger, the mild depression, when things get really stressful, when the person's sleep deprived, if the person's not eating right, the person's not able to exercise, 
um, uh, if a relationship does break up or if there's a lot of tension in a relationship, the things will get more stressful. And I would say the treatment process of borderline personality disorder is to build on prior successes. So to look at the past, so she got two years of remission. So I'm assuming that your daughter got at least two years of remission. So what, what was helpful? How did she get to that two-year mark? How did she get through it? What led up to that two years? And the more you can identify what was happening then that allowed you to be functioning better, then you can identify, well, what do we need to be doing now? And then build on it. So if she's not replicating all of the things, and again, I would go back to that bubble chart. Is her sleep the same? Is she still employed or not or in school or whatever? Does she have relationships similar? Is she exercising in the same way or not? Um, if any of those things have changed, and she was doing some of those things in her two-year remission, and she's not doing them now, I would say that's, an e that's easy, low-hanging fruit. Start doing those things again. Get back to where you are. But again, some of it's about mindset. A lot of it's about mindset, because I get how frustrating it is. I get how you can feel hopeless. She probably often feels hopeless. She, too feels desperate and suicidal at times probably because like, is this the life I'm going to have to lead? I'm so miserable. Um, I really do get it. I, I understand that and yet there's hope and you got to keep trying. And if she got a two-year remission, there's a very good chance she can get another two-year remission. And if you can keep building on it up to eight years, there's a very low likelihood that the symptoms will come back. Yeah. So our next question that was submitted, is it possible that BPD improves after menopause, maybe because of the decrease in hormones? Has it ever been noticed or investigated? So again, it, it's a great question. Um, and because it was submitted ahead of time, I was able to cheat and do a literature search because I am not a, I've never heard exactly this, that menopause induces remission from BPD symptoms. And in fact, at least my cursory search of all of the medical literature, there is nothing published on this topic. So nobody has definitively studied this topic. What I will tell you is that we know that if you follow people with BPD over a long period of time, as I was just talking about, a lot of them go into remission. So some people could improve, and it could just coincidentally be around the time of menopause. And then people might come to the erroneous conclusion that menopause somehow was associated with their remission. That's one possibility. There's another, there's another thought about this, and that there's clinical lore. And you might have heard this from a clinician, but a lot of clinicians will say, Borderline personality disorder burns out with age and that it's less likely to see it in older people. The people who say that usually still think of BPD as a chronic lifelong personality structure or trait that never changes. And so when they say it, they just say with age things get a little better. And again, I think what they're probably observing is um, people going into remission. Uh, but because the symptoms lasted for several years, it seemed like it was going to go on forever. Um, and then an, another hypothesis to throw out there is that some women can have really um, extreme mood and anxiety symptoms related to their menstrual period. So the official diagnosis is called premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And that is just not, it's not just a little moodiness or something around menses. It's actually full-fledged depression, horrible, sometimes debilitating depression around the time of period. 
And that, does, that disorder does seem to be related to hormones. And if a woman with BPD also had premenstrual dysphoric disorder, I imagine when she goes through menopause, she's going to be a lot better. She's going to look a lot better um, because the hormonal fluctuations aren't going on and she'll no longer have premenstrual dysphoric disorder and that might solve a lot of the problems. So those are my speculations, but the, the clear, concise answer is no, no one has studied borderline personality disorder and menopause. Okay, so our next question has several parts, so I'll read it through. Um, my son spent seven months in treatment for BPD and PTSD. He is back at college now and seems to be doing well. He found a therapist on his own where he lives and sees her a few times a month. Overall, he's doing the right things and we are proud of him, so we still have some questions. What can we do as his parents to be both supportive but also keep an eye on him so that things don't get bad again without us getting him the help he might need? He's also very thin. He stopped working out completely. Well, let, do you mind if I take one at a yeah. time? I'm sorry. <laughs> that might be easier. Okay. There are a lot of questions there, I see. Um, so what can you do as parents to be supportive? So he's an adult now, and um, he's off to college, and I'm assuming he wants his independence, and he is trying to break away from you and be less dependent on you. Um, and those are all really good things. Those are all really healthy things. And I understand the dilemma of somebody who has a child who has been maybe self-injurious, suicidal. I understand the instinct and urge to want to protect and keep that person safe. But if he's off to college and trying to separate from you and trying to manage his own affairs and do his own thing, I would encourage you to do your very best to support him in that and allow him whatever freedom he's asking for or requesting from you. That said, I would also say, I'm your mother, father, and I love you to death and I know what hell you've been through, and so how can I be helpful? Do you need anything from me? Would a weekly phone call be helpful? Would us coming to visit on a regular basis be helpful? Do you want to come home for some weekend? Would that be helpful? Like, and just make an offer. And it's, even if he says no to the offer, the fact that you have expressed concern and express the desire and willingness to do kind of whatever he wants on his own terms is going to be immensely helpful and make it much more likely that he will reach out to you if he does need you. Okay, so the next part, um, this person says he's very thin, stopped working out completely, and picked up vaping for the first time in the past year. How can we address this with him without making it worse? He's 21, and we didn't ask for consent, so it would be a one-sided conversation with his doctor. Maybe these habits are not important right now compared to the other demons he's fighting, so should we just let it go? We can't help wanting him to change these habits, as smoking is a killer, exercise is the key for, getting, for feeling better mentally, and we also worry he will get so thin that he'll end up in the hospital. So if you're worried that he will get so thin that he'll end up in the hospital, that my first concern is whether he has an eating disorder. So I don't know what very thin means to you, and uh, that would be the first question that I would raise. It, was he somebody who was overweight before, and now at college he's trying to be independent, trying to get in with the popular people or start dating or whatever, and does he, is he trying to get in more thin for that reason? Um, in which case, maybe that's a good thing, but the fact that you say that you're worried that he may end up in the hospital because he's getting so thin makes me worry about anorexia. And if he has, if he in fact has anorexia, that is a serious psychiatric diagnosis. and can become a very, very serious medical diagnosis. Um, and, uh, and so I think the step that I would take in terms of his thinness would be to express concern about that 
and, um, and ask him if he's seen his primary care doctor lately and uh, ask him if the primary care doctor has any concerns. If you have access to any friends, you could ask them what they think. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people with anorexia are in denial about or will deny it to you and they'll continue to waste away. Can I just interject that this participant has added some follow-up information that, yes, he does indeed have an eating disorder and his doctors are aware of it. So if he has an eating disorder and he is actively losing weight, it sounds like he's actively losing weight, that means the eating disorder is not under control. And then I would, um, again, revert back to the paradigm that I just talked about a little bit ago, express concern. Son, you are looking awfully thin. I'm starting to get worried. Um, I'm worried that maybe your eating disorder isn't under control, and I'm worried about your health, and I would love to be able to help you. Is there anything I can do to help with this? Do you need access to treatment? Do you, you know, what, what can we do to get you help for this eating disorder? Um, regarding the other kind of concerns that you've got about not exercising and vaping, I share your concerns. Um, I, I personally and professionally believe exercise is really important. Um, I think that for a lot of people, the patient with BPD who went into full recovery that I just mentioned a little bit ago, who's off all meds, no therapy, exercises a lot now. Never exercised before. Um, but in my working with her, I encourage her to exercise. So I, I agree that exercise is really important and good. I agree that vaping is dangerous and probably not good. But I think you have to choose your battles. Um, I think it's okay for you to go ahead and express concern about them and say, son, and while we're at it, or on, a, on another occasion, you can say, I'm not thrilled about that bait thing, honey. Um, but, you know, I'm, more, I'm, I'm a lot more concerned about the eating disorder, and so let's focus on the eating disorder for now, one thing at a time. And I think you can occasionally mention that you're not thrilled with the vaping, but you recognize that he's an adult now, he's at college, and you can't control him. And that's okay. And I think just recognizing both. So not getting into an argument, not badgering him, you've got to stop, whatever, but you can express concern. I'm concerned about the vaping, but I recognize you're an adult and it's your decision, and I, I respect that because that's not going to kill you right away. The eating disorder is a different thing. The eating disorder could kill you pretty soon. And so I, I, I have trouble letting that go and letting you just be an adult and make that decision because that's an illness. That's not really a lifestyle choice or habit. Okay, so the last part of this question was related to medication and recovery, which I think we covered earlier, so in the sake of time, I'm going to move forward. Great. Um, so this is a question about um, treatment. I know that good psychiatric management, GPM, is relatively new, and it did have one clinical trial showing its efficacy. Could you tell me when GPM will be available to clinicians in general? Um, so. GPM is, is called Good Psychiatric Management Now. The former, in its, in its preliminary existence, it was called General Psychiatric Management. So there are actually two controlled studies that were done that compared general psychiatric management to DBT. In fact, they are one and the same. General and good psychiatric management are the same thing, um, but they changed the terminology. And so when will it be available? It's available to clinicians everywhere now. The, the whole point of good psychiatric management is it is a set of core principles that every mental health clinician should learn if they are ever going to work with somebody with borderline personality disorder. Um, some clinicians don't learn them. Some clinicians don't get good training um, or good training in regards to BPD and that's why they've created a treatment called GPM but in fact 
any good psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker who has had thorough good training, including training on how to treat BPD, should have all of the skills and tools of GPM. So when a good clinician takes the GPM course, they usually come away from it saying, oh, I already do all of that. That's everything I do. And then they feel good about it. So GPM is available now. They, there are people doing trainings around the country. There was just a training in Los Angeles a, a couple months ago. Um, so it is available. And over the next year, Lois Choi Kane is hoping to um, develop a free webinar on GPM that will be available to clinicians anywhere for free. Um, so uh, it, it will be available soon. But again, I don't, I don't think most people need the specific training if they've had good core fundamental training in BPD anyway. Okay. So our next question says, I'm aware that many people who have a son or daughter with BPD are struggling with this. There has been concern about once they have had treatment and may be in remission and still unable to work or live outside the home in their 30s or 40s, then what? Many of us are getting to an age where we are unable to care for our loved ones. I would love to see places, group homes, et cetera, that would take in people with BPD. Places that I've talked to in my community are very reluctant to take someone with BPD. Can you comment on the dead end, which I find, which I slash we are finding ourselves in? Um, so I do have to say, this is kind of a really sad question, sad mindset. Um, I've seen it a lot. I don't know if it's a, it's a daughter, is that right? I forget. It doesn't say. So I don't know if it's a son or daughter that you have. Um, but I've talked to lots of parents who have come to the conclusion that this is going to go on forever. Relapses always happen. My child will never be able to be independent will never be able to function, and somehow it's up to me to take care of this person. Otherwise, she or he would be homeless or in some shelter or something. Um, and again, I can understand how people can arrive at those conclusions and can get into that space. And I want to say that there actually is still hope um, that your son or daughter can get better, even if they haven't after many years or decades. I've worked with patients who have been treated for three, four, five decades, and I have seen them get better after just a few years of treatment. So a lot of it really is about mindset. And I think the reason those patients got better is because when they came to me, I set new expectations for them. The expectations were no longer about just getting by, talking about past childhood events forever and ever or talking about the life that they wish they had had that will never be, and that's why they're so depressed. Instead, I kind of say, I don't want to do that, because I don't think that's going to be helpful to you. Instead, I want to start with, where do you want your life to be five years from now? And what do you think is realistic? And we try to have a conversation about the ideal and realistic and come to some reasonable expectations. But I will tell you, when I'm working with somebody who's very hopeless, who's completely discouraged, absolutely has this fixed mindset that this is forever, this is the way I'm going to be, it's never going to get better, that I have to do a lot of prompting. I have to do a lot of pushing was like, well, I understand that that's where you're at, but I'm, I don't agree. And if you just want to stay this way, then I'm not the clinician you should be working with, because 
I want to help people get better. If you want to work with me, we're going to have to come up with some goals of things that you want to be better. And almost always those things involve all the bubbles that I illustrated to you that will eventually improve functioning, that will improve self-esteem, that will improve and encourage independence. Um, the bottom line is that borderline personality disorder is still a highly stigmatized diagnosis. And so you're right. I, I, I don't think that there are chronic group homes for people with borderline personality disorder. There are certainly residential treatment programs um, which usually cost a fair amount of money. Um, but in terms of taking care of people, I do know, at least in the state of Massachusetts, the Department of Mental Health has subsidized housing for people with chronic mental illness. And somebody with borderline personality disorder can, in fact, access that housing and those services. And so if you're an elderly parent and you're in this situation, your son or daughter can probably, depending on what state you're in, can probably access some kind of department of mental health or whatever, social service kind of residential housing options. If they're on disability, they can probably qualify for subsidized housing, apartment, whatever. Um, so those programs do exist, and they're, those are where people like your son or daughter that you're describing right now, if you were to die right now, and your son or daughter really could not function independently, that's where they would end up. Um, instead, I really want to encourage you to first work on your mindset. I, I, your question makes me feel hopeless. I feel your hopelessness. Um, and, and I want to confront and challenge you and your mindset, first and foremost, because I think if you want to be a resource to your child, you have to have hope. Your child doesn't, and your child has an illness, and it's going to be harder for him or her to get hope. So you have to be the one to first get some hope. Um, I'm hoping that the webinar that I did the other day, it was two weeks ago now, I guess, I'm hoping that instilled some hope. I'm hoping tonight's session might instill some hope. Um, watch it again. Have your son or daughter watch it with you. Talk about it. I would ask your son or daughter, what do you want your life to be? Is this really what you want? because it makes me sad. I think you should also say, I'm really worried about you. I'm worried about what's going to happen to you when I'm not here. And I would love to help figure out a way for you to be OK, for me to know that you can take care of yourself, so that I don't have to worry that when I'm dead, you're going to be in a homeless shelter or dead. Um, that can be a way to start the conversation. And hopefully, your son or daughter will have some hopes and goals for what life could look like. And then you just start to make incremental steps toward them. It can be with structure. It can be with psychotherapy or medications. It can be with uh, you know, mindfulness, starting mindfulness. He or she's not doing that. It can be starting an exercise routine. It can be any of those things to just start to make some progress, but always working toward the master goal. Because none of those things in and of themselves will give meaning and purpose. And so you can't ask somebody to get up out of bed and have structure and end there. If that's, if, because if that's the only reason they're doing it, they're going to get pretty hopeless and frustrated and give up pretty quickly. Because that in and of itself is not going to solve their problems and is not going to bring joy or happiness or peace to them. So instead, they have to be doing those things for, for the purpose of, a, of getting to a larger goal. 
which is being independent, um, living on their own, getting a job, having a boyfriend or girlfriend, or just having friends, or getting a dog, or whatever they want to do. So we are past time, but so we will end on that message of hope. Um, thank you, Dr. Palmer. And uh, we got through a lot of questions. Unfortunately, as usual, we did not get to them all. Uh, we hope you can join us for our next webinar on October 13th um, with Dr. Jillian Galen. We'll talk about validation, making sense of the emotional turmoil in borderline personality disorder, and registration links are on your screen as is our website if you'd like to look at the recordings of our previous webinars.